Uh, welcome everyone in this room and welcome everyone online to this uh, Chatham House members event on climate and conflict and security. Um, my name is Robert Faulkner. I'm the research director of the LSE's Grantham Research Institute on Climate Change and the Environment, but I've also been spending a lot of time doing work on the environment here at Chatham House. It's a great pleasure for me to chair this event tonight. Uh, as you may know, this members event is being recorded, so it's on the record, and if you're a member, then you should be able to access a recording at a later point. You, the audience, will have a chance to put questions to our panelists uh, this evening. Uh, if you're in the room, then please just raise your hand, stay seated, a microphone will come to you. And if you're online, I think I will be able to see your questions coming through, then please use the Q&A function and put the questions uh, to me, and I will then call on you to read out your question and keep it brief, as always, and keep it to the point and, and finish with a question mark. I think that's the general guidance that we like to see in these kind of events. Um, last organizational point, there will be a drinks reception after this event, straight at the end at seven o'clock, and for that, please follow us up to the library on the ground floor, which is when you came in uh, somewhere on, the, on your right. I think there's another event happening, just ignore that. We have our own space for that. Good, so we are going to discuss climate and security. Um, I think it's fair to say the global landscape on security is changing rapidly. Uh, everyone has been fixated by the horrific events that have been happening in Ukraine. Russia's invasion has not just caused huge human suffering in Ukraine, but has also upset the European security order. Beyond that, however, we have seen a more long-term trend that is now playing out in many parts of the world. Climate change is producing ecological stresses that are translating into social and political upheaval that is undermining stable and less stable political orders, is causing migration flows, is disrupting food flows and trade and is causing human suffering on an ever larger scale. Climate change in that sense poses a new risk to global security, but one that we have now gained a better understanding of. And so in this event today, we're going to take a closer look at how climate and security are linked. And the occasion for this, the very happy occasion for this event, is the recent launch of CIPRI's new report on environment of peace, which I understand has just come out two weeks ago. Uh, and we are going to take that as our launching pad for this discussion. Um, but before we do that, we'll hear a brief video about the report. Let me just briefly introduce our panelists in the order in which they will speak. And then I will shut up and, and lay, lead over into the uh, opening statements. First up will be the director of CIPRI, Dan Smith, who has come from Stockholm for this event. Dan has a long record of research on uh, international peace and security. He has focused on climate change and insecurity, peace and security issues in the Middle East. Uh, he has a long-standing record of working on peace building issues, including several years that he spent on the UN peace building, peace building fund advisory group, two of which he served as the chair of that group. Uh, he was a part-time professor of peace and conflict at the University of Manchester and is the author of endless numbers of publications in this field. Far too many for me to mention any of this. Uh, Dan, you will kick off in just a moment after the video presentation. I will then call on our panelist who is on the screen that I think you will be able to see. Adenike Titilope is the founder of I Lead Climate Action Initiative. Adenike is a self-described eco-feminist, eco-reporter, and climate justice leader. She founded this initiative uh, in order to advocate for a restoration of Lake Chad, uh, which is intended to strengthen the livelihoods of those that are affected by the gradual disappearing of Lake Chad. She has a long-standing interest in peace, security, and equality in Africa. She's a former spokesperson for Care International in the UK on climate and gender. She was a Nigerian youth uh, delegate at COP25 and COP26. And uh, she's the recipient of the Ambassador of Conscience Award by Amnesty International in Nigeria, among many other 
uh, uh, awards that she has won for her activism and work. And last but not least is Claudia Land, the Senior Research Fellow here in the Environment and Society Programme at Chatham House. Uh, uh, Glada has joined, joined uh, Chatham House in 2004, I just reminded myself. So yeah, we have yeah. overlapped for quite some time here in the programme. Glada has produced many important reports in a wide range of areas that relate to this topic. She's worked on petroleum sector governance, Asian foreign resource investment, access to energy in developing countries, and sustainable tra transitions in the fossil fuel sector. Her current project, Cascades, which she's conducting with a number of European Union partners, is on access, uh, on assessing the transboundary risks of climate impacts and making recommendations on actions in this area. So, without much further ado, let me stop here and let me now invite you all to listen to a short presentation on the CPRI report. Insecurity and conflict are on the rise. Human activity is putting the natural environment under more stress than ever before. It is an increasingly toxic mix. The number of armed conflicts around the world has doubled in just 10 years. So has the number of people displaced from their homes. Spending on arms is increasing, global hunger is growing. At the same time, environmental crises are adding new risks to security. Drought leads to failed crops, floods force people from their homes, ocean ecosystems die. The twin security and environmental crises are creating new, complex risks and compromising our prospects of achieving and maintaining peace. The result? A new era of risk. Unless we take action, the situation will only get worse. There is a way forward. It is possible to build the foundations of a new security, and it begins by acknowledging that we need to tackle the twin crises together. We must address the root causes of the environmental crisis, cutting carbon emissions quickly, reducing pollution, restoring forests, protecting nature. However, solutions meant to address environmental issues can have unintended negative impacts on peace and security. We must enable a green transition that is both just and peaceful, with policies that avoid sparking new opposition or conflicts. Governments need to switch spending from things that fuel the twin crises, such as building their armed forces and fossil fuel subsidies, to activities that restore the environment and build peace. Environmental integrity and peace are inextricably linked. By addressing them together, we ensure that measures aimed at solving one problem don't make the other worse. Ideally, they would create positive synergies. The Environment of Peace Report explores options for building peace in this new era of risk based on principles of urgency, fairness and far-sightedness. It makes recommendations that everyone can use, from the United Nations to governments, from financial institutions to civil society. The need is urgent and time is running out. Find out how we can build an environment of peace. Great, thank you for that. Dan, could you please start us off? I'll give our panelists about five minutes for opening statements and then we'll hear from the other two. So five minutes, thank you very much, Robert, and thank you to Chatham House for organizing this event and everybody for coming. Five minutes is a great challenge. And I mean, it's a great one because it demands that you boil it down. Right? So the environmental crisis is having an impact on our well-being, and there is evidence for that. There has been evidence of that growing over the past three decades. I would say that over the last one and a half decades, it has become steadily unmistakable. It's only if you close one eye that you fail to see it. It has that impact in a number of different ways, and this is what sometimes complicates the discussion. But as the film was pointing out, whether it's through a sudden shock, uh, such as an extreme weather event like flooding, or it is more through slow onset uh, problems such as drought, there's an impact upon people. And in this whole picture, people are the problem, basically. 
There's no such thing as an environmental, a purely environmental issue. Right? It's always to do with the relationship between the natural environment and us, both our impact upon it and its effect upon us. When we're thinking about its effect upon us as a consequence of what we have done, the most important sort of intervening variable is governance. So if the government response to the drought or the flood or the sea level surge or whatever it may be, is a positive one, creative, inclusive, brings people in, you know, yeah, people suffer a bit, but there's no really serious problem. If it's poor, if it's oppressive, if it's um, underfunded, if it's aggressive, if it blames the people, then there's going to be difficulties. Then you start getting potential grievances, instability, and clear evidence that this can lead to the point of violent conflict. Not always, but it can. Actually, those same environmental stresses in different con contexts can lead to more cooperation between people. So you can't necessarily predict what's going to happen, but you can see it. Now, at the same time, conflict or conflictual relationships make it harder to handle environmental problems. I'll give you one example. There's a massive ship off the coast of Yemen now, which has been rusting for seven years and is waiting to cause an abominable environmental disaster, which can't be addressed because of the, the violent conflict uh, in, in Yemen. But we can also see it and worry about it in terms of geopolitics. As geopolitical confrontation increases, that has a potentially malign impact upon the chances of uh, cooperation to resolve environmental questions. And I think that's one of the dilemmas that we live with at the moment, which is that whether you think about the pandemic or you think about climate change or loss of biodiversity or indeed air pollution or plastics pollution or land use problems, persistently as a solution, as an approach, what you need to think about is cooperation. So we have an unprecedentedly increasing need for international cooperation at a time when sadly, the international appetite for cooperation is, uh, is, is declining. People sometimes ask me, I've been working on this for a decade and a half now, and people sometimes ask me, Dan, why do you want to bring environment and peace together? And my answer is I don't, right? Do you honestly think that I or anyone can bring environment and peace together? These are huge things, be serious, right? Environment and peace are so inextricably linked that if you damage one, you damage the other. But the good news, which we've also tried to unearth through the report, is that if you enhance one, uh, you enhance the, the other. So um, I'm inclined to say that, you know, the, the policy report is a mere whatever it is, 92 pages or thereabouts long, and you can gallop through it and find the um, conclusions and the recommendations at the end. But let me summarize very quickly in headline form. One is that linked crises need joint solutions. The second joined up solutions. The second thing is we have to get better at investing in preparedness and resilience and the prevention of crisis and violent conflict. We should be thinking much more seriously about what it would mean to finance peace rather than risk. We spend directly, not calculating indirect costs and so on, we spend directly $500 billion a year worldwide subsidizing fossil fuel industries which is increasing risk. Right? We need to be instead financing peace. It's important when thinking these things through to understand that there are risks involved in almost any course of action. So the transition that we need to see, the Green Deal, the zero carbon economy, the brown to green transformation, this is a big thing. There will be losers as well as winners in this. So our fourth area of recommendations is on the importance of delivering a transition that is both just and peaceful. If it's not made explicit and done deliberately, it won't be done. Fifth, in order to do that, maximize inclusivity. And lastly, as the, in some senses, the basis for all of this, we need more understanding, more education, more information, and we need to operationalize that in government systems to have better foresight of the problems coming down the road at us. I'll leave it there, and I hope that I've done at least enough to provoke some questions. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Dan.
And let me go now to Nigeria. Adeniki, can you hear us? Yeah, I can hear you. You have five minutes. Okay, thank you so much. Um, thank you, Environmental Peace and Chatham House. I'm very excited to be here to speak about something I'm, I am passionate about. Looking at the fact that I advocate for the restoration of nature that I've shrunk by 90%, and I specialize in peace, security, equality in Africa, especially the Lake Chad region. And looking at the fact that um, climate change in Africa is not just leading to conflict, but harmed conflict. And we are seeing this through different underlying issues like food insecurity, hunger, resource control poverty and the rest that are, that have been lingering for so long. And a, a practical example is that of the shrinking later, the, the child that has shrunk by 90% and have displaced more than 40 million people. And so how do you expect there should be peace in the place where there are, no, there are lots of livelihoods? And so that is why I always mention the fact that um, peace is not just the absence of war, but the ability for us to sustain our livelihoods. Because loss of livelihoods is one of the strategy that harmed group or violent hand group such as Boko Haram and the rest are using to expand their boundaries to um, recruit more people, young, old, different groups into their group to become perpetrators of evil in their society. And this we are seeing in Nigeria spreading across West Africa. And we are seeing it in Ethiopia, in Mali, in Sudan and the rest. And this is our reality here in Africa that we are being affected by conflict. And, um, a practical example was where I schooled in the food basket of the nation because they have a, um, a fertile and arid land, uh, uh, um, arid land that is very good, um, that could um, feed the nation because for it to be named as the food basket of the nation, it has a vegetative um, and fertile landscape. And so this makes the farmers and the headsmen to clash a lot because they have things in common. They both depend on the vegetative cover, the shrinking, um, natural resources like the water, um, like water and other things that intersect or integrate their needs together. And so this makes them to clash a lot, leading to conflict. And one of my visits in the school, when I went there, I could see one of the internally displaced um, people's camp among many and um, asking them about what happened. They could tell me that they were displaced due to conflict. Um, that arise. And so one of those, those people that spoke with me, they are farmers. And so you could imagine um, thousands of farmers being displaced in the camp. Definitely it's affecting the food system. And so we need to uh, provide long lasting, sustainable life for you. It's not enough when we provide food or shelter or give them water, drinks, clothes for them. But what matters most is when we are able to give them sustainable, long-lasting livelihoods. So that through that means they could provide food, clothing, shelter, educate their children, because these people uh, or climate change and conflict, it could be the biggest driver of um, out of school children in this um, decade, because that is what we are seeing, the floods, the droughts, the conflict, displacing young people, uh, making them or depriving them from education. And at the same time, women and girls are being affected because they are either raped or being given out in marriage as a survival strategy. And so we need to look at it from different perspectives, from the gender perspective, from the loss of livelihoods, and then the action that we need from governments and from individuals to see that we're able to um, tackle the issue of insecurity, because these are the major issues that's affecting us currently, and we are seeing it all around. And so in where I'm from, Nigeria, people are seeing it as an ethnic or religion issue, because those are the things that interplay. Because in, the, in, in, in a setting like Nigeria, where we have different religion, different um, culture, it's, it's, it affects the peace and security because little or very few people are seeing it from the environmental perspective. And that is what is bringing conflict enough because people are seeing it that this is a political, ethnic, religion, but not environmental issues. And so that is why we need to educate the people to get to know what is happening around them. Because if you are not educated 
of course, you can't find solution. You don't even know that it's a problem at the first, at the first instance. Mm -hmm. So we need to educate the people to get them um, um, a readiness mechanism for them to understand the fact that this is our reality and we have to um, stand against it with different actions that are necessary. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you, Adenike. Um, last but not least, Claudia, your five minutes. Thank you, Robin. Thank you, Adenike and, and Dan, for those insights. I, I wanted to start by really reinforcing what um, Dan said about, um, you know, climate change and environmental degradation not instigating conflict in, in, in itself, um, but rather, um, rather, um, playing a role in conflict due to uh, our society's inability to cooperate or plan long term and this is a you know this is a huge problem in the in the middle east and north africa region which i'm going to to talk about and as you said as well conflict uh cripples the ability to build that resilience to to have those long-term plans and also to cooperate across boundaries because of course um the environment and climate has no respect for political borders. Um, so maybe I can provide a little bit of uh, flesh to the bones on this idea of interactions between uh, climate and conflict in the region. Uh, there's a lot to say about it. I mean, you can talk about the weaponization of environment in recent conflicts, uh, but I thought I'd concentrate on just a few examples uh, really where um, uh, environmental events have provoked public protest, often violent, and, and the reasons for that. Um, I mean, in the MENA region, we've seen so much uh, war, conflict, um, and human displacement over the last decade. Uh, it's, it's a region where there's more than 13 million, you know, displaced or made refugees in the region. Um, and the uh, and you and you've also got this um large uh, economic dependence on oil and gas rents which i'll come to later so there's some some specific dynamics that are in the mix here um when we're talking about climate change and and also the way that uh global shifts in the economy will affect these countries and their ability to to build resilience so first of all um we could think about slow onset stresses and I thought I'd mention Syria because there was a number of papers over you know a few years ago on the link between climate change and the Syrian war um, I'd be very very reluctant to attribute um, the conflict to climate change but there was a role in terms of years of drought causing migration uh, of rural populations in into the urban areas putting pressure on municipal services and, and social cohesion uh, which you know, several Syrians have said to me certainly played played a role in uh, lead, leading up to the to the, to the protests and and the uh, uh, oppressive response to those. Um, but I think you know it underscores how we have to think about the governance, the mismanagement of water that had preceded that. Um, particularly, I mean, there's there's several things to consider: the lack of transboundary cooperation between. Turkey, Syria, and Iraq, which continues uh, to cause great stress to, to rural dwellers and farmers in that region. Um, the neglect of the rural areas, the inequality in water distribution and issues like this also, or, and, and economic reforms which were seen to um, increase that inequality. Um, and that comes to the, um, the other role of, of environmental uh, disasters and, um, and, and damage, which anger people and that's when it it directly implicates a government a, a regime in corrupt practices in poor management uh, when it underscores that and you've seen that in events like the mass water poisonings in southern iraq in 2018 in basra where you had like about 118,000 people hospitalized because of the contamination now that wasn't uh only due to climate change, although that played some role, but it was the, um, you know, the, the treatment plants that were not working for reasons of, of corruption and, and disrepair and neglect. There was the, uh, again, a poor transboundary management causing the salinization of the water. But it was, it, it led to the violent protests because um, Basra is an oil rich 
province, you know, people are very aware of the acute inequalities between uh, those that have, those that uh, have the, the prestige, the patronage networks, and those that don't, and unemployment and frustrations over corruption, of course, were underlying those protests. So there's that, there's that trigger um, uh, context. And, that, and, and you saw it with the forest fires in Lebanon as well, and, and, and the two October 19 um, protest movements that took place both in Lebanon and Iraq were very linked to issues like uh, power outages, uh, yeah, poor provision for waste disposal um, and water management. So I think looking forward, just to say, uh, just to say one thing about transition. So um, there is a fear in countries that are highly dependent on oil and gas that they're going to lose out um, uh, and that this transition is happening too quickly it's unfair um, and that they won't be able to diversify fast enough um, again coming back to iraq it's uh, you know it's, it, it's government is 90 percent or more dependent on those oil revenues for everything it spends so i just wanted to throw that in the mix and to, for us to think about what countries um, and governments, what countries and governments do when they're facing desperate times, um, especially given that those export revenues need to pay for food, highly, highly food dependent region. Um, and with droughts happening in other parts of the world, um, price rising, uh, prices rising for food, as, as we see currently with the Russia Ukraine war, um, those tensions will be more acute. Great. Thank you so much, Clara. Okay. I can see a few questions coming online, but um, I'll give you a moment to think about your questions. Please do raise your hand if you would like to put a question. And uh, if I call anyone from the audience, please state your name and perhaps your affiliation so we know who is speaking. But I'll, I'll give you a moment just to reflect on your question, but, but do uh, get them ready. I, I'll start off with my own question that I want to put to the three panelists. We've heard from several of you now that the link between climate change and conflict is often a very local link. And it's happening on the ground, it's happening in Nigeria, it's happening around Lake Chad, it's happening in the Middle East. It, it, it revolves and it ori originates in conflicts over local resources. So in some ways one could argue that the answer therefore, the policy solution has to be also very local, has to be rooted in, as, as we heard from Nigeria, Adeniki spoke about creating sustainable livelihoods that, that are lasting and that are resilient. But I want to ask you, since this is Chatham House, so where does the international come into this? In what ways is this a truly international challenge and what roles do international organizations play here? How should we think about this nexus here between the international and the local? Um, I want to throw this open for the whole panel. So, um, reversing the order, perhaps. Adonika, do you want to go first on this? Okay, thank you so much. Um, very good question that you just mentioned that um, because um, solving the climate change crisis, no one could solve that crisis. It all has to be um, a collective um, way of solving the crisis. And very good example is that of the Lake Chad issue, looking about the need for international support um, as well as local support, looking at also projects like the Great Green Wall. Maybe one of those things that wouldn't have made this project a reality is because we are not involving those at the grassroots to champion these solutions. We are not involving them, and yet we want to realize the solution. It's not possible that way. We have to align with the grassroots people. And that is why whenever we carry out our action, we try to um, liaise with the grassroots people to see that it becomes successful. And one, one major thing that we also need to look inward is also not using military action in, instead of um, climate action, because the peace and uh, the, the, the conflict that is happening, we are seeing more of military action. Um, in West Africa, we are seeing foreign agency or international agencies deploying their military force to that um, region which shouldn't be so, you know, such solutions should come from the local um, 
communities that have been impacted, they know the reality of the crisis that they are faced with, and they can solve the issues if they are given the chance, the space to, to do all of those solutions themselves. And so we have to look inward that military action wouldn't solve the problem, whether it's these are all environmental crises that are caused by climate change crisis. So it's not by military crisis, it's an environmental crisis. And so that is why when we are bringing international solution, we all have to localize it in the grassroots to see that it fits into the larger solutions that we are bringing on board. Because the IPCC reports um, mentioned about maladaptation. And so maladaptation comes into place because we are not integrating the grassroots solution into the larger solutions that we are bringing on board. So in as much as we need international cooperation, multilateralism, we also need to look at the grassroots level, which of the solution is going to suit best and also creating fund climate finance, because without climate finance, there is no way we could carry out our climate action. There is no way we could build resilience. There is no way we could have um, um, justice that we need. And so all of these have to be put in place to see that we have a successful um, um, solutions that fit into the scenario. Yeah, thank right. you. Thank you very much. Clara, um, Adenike mentioned the tendency or the temptation to go for military solutions, particularly as you mentioned the situation in Syria where uh, it, it was a military conflict that resulted from various environmental and political stresses. How do you interpret the role that military solutions can play here? Yeah, I, I, I would definitely um, just stress that. Um, the, the, the conflicts that we see in, in the Middle East and North Africa and in many other places, they're not happening in a vacuum, you know, they're, they're fueled by um, various, uh, both regional political maneuvers and international uh, sales of weapons, uh, support for oppressive regimes um, without any conditionality. So there's, I think there's a very, very strong need for international donors and financiers who are also trying to promote climate resilience to look at their policies um, across the board and seeing whether these are cohesive or whether you know they are actually undoing some of the good actions that they're trying to uh, fund on the ground um, and secondly in terms of that on the ground action just to come to Adanika's point about local actors one of the very strong recommendations that came from our consultations with many experts in the MENA region was for actors like the EU and the multilateral development banks uh, to work much more closely to empower uh, municipalities and CSOs, civil society organizations, who are often highly constrained, both in terms of resources and their, their uh, legal abilities. So that, and, and to connect them, uh, hopefully, with, with national government efforts as well. But as you say, action has, you know, the first response to some of these crises has to happen at the local level. And at the moment, they're not, um, uh, the, the response capacity is weak. Hmm. Dan, same question to you. How do you define the international responsibility in this field, particularly with regard to international organizations? Yeah, I think there's so many places to jump into it that it's, uh, you know, you're going to have to put up your hand to stop me at a certain <laughs> point because the list gets quite long. But take Egypt in 2011, Tahir Square. People are holding up banners which say for bread and dignity. Where does, the, where does the food part of that come, come from? It comes from wildfires in Russia uh, the year before. It comes from an extraordinarily wet um, growing season in, uh, in, in China the, the year before. And it comes from a US shift of a lot of um, farmland that had been used for growing crops to, to biofuels. Right? So a, a well-intentioned policy and a couple of effects of uh, particular weather systems producing food price volatility on a global scale, which couldn't be handled by some countries, particularly those which are importing a lot of food and then subsidizing the price of staples for their populations, such as Egypt. So there's just as there is a story about, uh, if you're telling the story of the Syrian conflict, if you leave nature out of it, uh, you're not telling the whole story. The same with the um, beginning of the Arab Spring in Egypt. It's just that the local was in three different places, four different places, if you include Egypt. Um, 
A similar effect is going to be seen with, uh, with Ukraine now. I mean, look at India, um, the impact of climate change on the, um, the, the wheat harvest in India, um, the, at the same time as the food is being blockaded, um, with worse fears about what may happen next year if the um, fertilizer doesn't get into the ground in, in Ukraine during the growing season this year. So there's a lot of impacts that combine together. And yes, it's local in every case, it's individual in every case, it's affecting human well-being. But if the international context is not conducive to cooperation or to handling these issues, um, everything gets particularly serious. Then in addition, there's mitigation of um, carbon emission, greenhouse gas emissions in order to address some of the root causes. Adaptation is a local thing, but the financing for adaptation will very often have to be uh, international. And the management of the conflicts which arise when things have been gotten wrong will certainly involve um, a local element. If it doesn't, it's going to go wrong. But again, it very often needs international financing, international support, it may need a peacekeeping force and so on. So all the time that you're talking about the local, you should also be talking about the international and, and vice versa as well. There is a red thread connecting them all the time. Very good, thank you. Okay, let's now take questions from the audience, both in the room and online. I'll try and take two or three together and mix it also with uh, online questions. Maybe start over there, the gentleman there with the white shirt. Uh, the, the microphone's coming, just a moment. Uh, I have a question for the panel about the, uh, about the uh, conflict in Ukraine. So the European response appears to be pretty clear uh, in the short term, pulling in more gas, uh, medium term, stepping up its ambition on decarbonization. Um, what I'm interested in is what the response outside Europe might be, uh, particularly China and India. That's great, thank you. And if you, if you feel like it, you can state your name and affiliation. I'm, uh, I'm Jeevan Varsaga. I'm the climate editor at Tortoise Media. Wonderful. And I'm going to the Zoom room, as, as it's now known. And there's a question from Kieran O'Meara. Now let's see if this experiment works. Kieran, uh, are you able to put your question? Otherwise, I'll read it out. This is a pause for dramatic effect. Um, <laughs> I'm checking my online feed here. No, I think it's not working. So on this occasion, I shall read the question, but then we'll try again another time. So Kieran's question uh, is the following. Can the global climate crisis and the conflict this phenomenon has caused be addressed without first uh, addressing the issue of global justice? Or can the current global order allow for the crisis to be assessed without the structures of global justice being altered? So a big question that follows on from the very specific that you've just heard. Who would like to answer those two questions to start with? And I should, I should mention again, not all panelists have to answer all questions. Who would like to um, go first? Maybe I have to say on the Ukraine crisis, I mean, I think without knowing what the most recent announcements are, I would say that India and China would want to take the Russian oil and gas that's not going to Europe. Um, and I know there were some early uh, statements from India that it would um, kind of provide, you know, more grain to the global economy, but then found because of its drought that it couldn't actually do that um, and imposed uh, some restrictions on exports. Uh, so that's that's what I see for now. I think, I mean, the US is playing an interesting game. I mean, traditional responses in terms of Biden's planned visit to Saudi and trying to encourage the production of more oil elsewhere, but at the same time, um, uh, 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 trying to promote uh, solar production at home um, in, in a short in a short time frame. So. Okay. Adonikia, I can see you. Would you like to answer any of these two questions? Yeah, um, talking about the Ukraine and Russia um, clashes or conflicts, so to see. Um, very well, um, the fossil fuel are proving that um, it's a weapon of mass, um, uh, it's a weapon of mass destruction because we are seeing it from what is happening currently. And the fact that um, climate change could also lead to conflict if we don't deal with it. 
because it provides an enabling environment for violence, for conflict, for war. And um, one of those things that it builds is to affect our diversification, just like that of Nigeria, that we have di different diversity. And so that of Ukraine to have shown us that we need to, to transit towards renewable sources of energy that could help our systems to become resilient enough because we, we could not, we cannot stand and take that risk of inaction why not dealing with the impact of climate change? And very well to mention about the fact that um, voluntary commitments will take us no way until we start making commitments that we have no option than to do. Then that way we have headway towards winning the race against the climate change crisis. And so all commitments, all policies have to be back up with infrastructures. And so we have to look inward to see that such scenario of um, the Ukraine and Russia crisis doesn't exist again, doesn't come up again, because the effect of one war between these two countries is felt by Africa. It's felt by the humanitarian hate that are needed to combat the climate change crisis. We have seen it through um, different actions that we should have realized. The number of money that have been spent in the Russian and Ukraine crisis is affecting climate action. Because if such money is being used towards transition, it would have gone a long way towards solving the climate change crisis. Won't have been seen ag aggregating um, crisis like the peace issues, the insecurity or conflict issues. And so if we don't tackle the climate change crisis, it will lead to another bigger issue in the future that we might not be able to tackle. And so that is what I have for this question. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, and Climate change is often portrayed as a justice issue. Mm -hmm. How does that relate to the, the link with conflict? Sure. Where, where does the justice dimension well, come into your thinking? If I think about Kieran's question, right, my reaction to it is completely different based on the presence or absence of a single word. And that word is first. So if the question is, can, we, uh, can the global crisis be addressed without first addressing the question of global justice, my answer is we can't wait. And if the question instead were, can, global crisis, can the global environmental crisis be addressed without addressing global justice, my answer is absolutely not. It has to be a just and fair as well and a peaceful transition. Otherwise, it's not going to work, right? So I see cluster, climate justice as being not only about a basic kind of ethical commitment towards uh, fairness in society and between different societies. I see it also as being an issue about how you how we make this enormous change work. It's going to take a huge amount of effort. It's going to take a lot of really good brains working together, but it's also going to take a lot of people in their daily lives changing things and being committed into changing things. And that's not just in the rich world. That's not just thinking about, oh, how I must be buying um, organic at Sainsbury's or, you know, Waitrose or, in my case, Ica in the corner, uh, in, in stock, around the corner in Stockholm where I live. It's about everybody in different places changing the, the, the way that they live, both for adaptation purposes and also um, as part of mitigation and, and, and limiting greenhouse gas emissions. You can't do that unless the process is inclusive and unless the results are relatively speaking fair. So living in an unjust and unequal world, we have to address the questions of justice mm -hmm. alongside of addressing the questions of environment. May I just come in on that last point you raised? Does this also mean we have to compensate those that are currently holding fossil fuel assets that are being phased out? Does justice also demand that we compensate those that will lose out in terms of their economic development potential? I personally, I wouldn't start at the point of compensation, right? To say, because I mean, I think there are people in this process who need, mm -hmm. in this whole picture, who need to be compensated. We could start by paying for some of the damage that we, mm -hmm. have, we have done. Um, but I wouldn't start by thinking about compensation for um, fossil fuel assets and so on. I would rather think about what is the social change? What is the change which is going to be needed in these different countries, different places, including in the oil rich uh, Middle East. What transitions and changes are going to be made? How can they be made peacefully 
and relatively fairly. But no, I don't think I want to kind of, you know, fund super yacht habits of the super rich because they happen to hold a whole lot of fossil fuel reserves. And you mentioned loss and damage, which is currently on the agenda again uh, yes, exactly. in Bonn at the climate section. And, and about which, time that it came back on the agenda. Which has been on the well. agenda for a long time, and northern yeah. countries have blocked that agenda. Okay, let me take some more questions. I'm always keen to, to bring your gender balance into the mix. So I'm going to take the lady here in the second row first, and then right next to you. Hi, my name is Nikki. Uh, I'm a student at King's College. Um, I have a question about this uh, Ukraine-Russia uh, situation. Um, it has an impact on global uh, energy uh, prices and a lot of uh, countries are, are exploring uh, diversification of their energy source. So do you say there is a risk that some country might adopt like less clear energy in a way to kind of uh, shift uh, their you know, um, energy source uh, mix uh, in the short term and also about the you know the clear energy uh, you know strategy going forward we see a lot of you know supply issues uh, in this like renewable uh, energy uh, supply chains uh, in terms of you know uh, you know uh, some sort of uh, uh, materials that, that they needed to secure in mm. the developing countries so uh, do you see there is also risks there thank you great thank you and if you could just pass on the mic to the gentleman in the second row next Next, it. I'm not sure. Yeah, it should work. Hi, uh, Hugo Barker from Imperial. Uh, last year, I did research in a developing country that's going to be hit significantly in their agricultural industry by climate change on the use of agrivoltaics. And I found the cost of energy was very low. The use of agrivoltaics had been beneficial to mitigating climate change, all, all these benefits. However, by the end of my research, I found that the current regulatory format of that country wouldn't allow energy to be sold back to the grid, which made the whole thing not economically viable. I'm now advising on another project in another country uh, with agrivoltaics that's having a similar bureaucratic kind of issue around they don't actually recognize the technology. They don't know if it's energy production or it's agriculture. Um, my question to the panel is, well, two things, is um, do you think this bureaucratic issue is a limiting factor for the application of technology and kind of the, the limiting of climate change? And what would your advice be to kind of combating this, especially in countries that may be suffering from corruption and other incentives? Mm. Good. I'll bring in a third question so that the panel can uh, pick their favorite question. There was a, the gentleman there in the last room. Yes, please. Uh, thank you. My name is Mark Schuper. I started and run an education NGO in Hong Kong, where I live. Uh, going back, and this is a more macro question, I guess we had COP26 seven months ago now, roughly. Uh, to what degree would the panelists feel or not that this linkage of, of climate and conflict security was recognized by the participants at COP26? And to the degree it was recognized, to what degree do you feel it was addressed with a plan with timely action items? Very, very good questions indeed, which also raises the question, if I may add one, which is what role could the COP process play in addressing climate and conflict issues? So first question on a rising conflict around the energy transition. Uh, you also mentioned conflict around scarce resources that are needed in the transition, the bureaucratic hurdles, and then finally the COP26. Okay. Uh, take your Have pick. a go. There, there's so Donna. much there, so I'll just sort of pick and choose. Um, yes, I think a lot of people feel that the um, the Russia-Ukraine crisis has pushed things back in terms of energy transition with countries who have oil and gas resources and were thinking about maybe, um, you know, drawing those down or not issuing um, new production licenses are, are, are now going ahead and there's it's, it's kind of enabled those with an interest in the industry to push forward uh, with plans to, um, to invest in new acreage. Now that logic seems pretty flawed because what we need is more production now. I don't doubt that, a more production of, um, of gas in particular. Uh, but if you're investing in new acreage now, it's not really gonna be coming online for another five, 10 years, you know, depending on the, on, on the environment and the discovery. So, um, so I'd say, Yes, it's enabled those interests to um, have a field day. Uh, but um, on the other hand, of course, it provides this very, very strong uh, justification 
to think long term about reducing dependence and one would hope that investment in efficiency and retrofitting and um, uh, and, and creating you know the kind of passive infrastructure which would reduce radically would, which would have radically reduced uh, dependence here in the UK you know actually gets gets a boost um, just on on uh, the regulatory question and the, and the policies and in country in developing countries that have long um, prevented uh, large-scale implementation of uh, renewable energy so solutions that would make sense, including in the agricultural sector. Yes, uh, you know the financial stability of utilities, the um, the, the, the the lack of um, bankability of projects has been a problem, and particularly fuel subsidies. You know uh, where diesel prices are high enough to incentivize off-grid opportunities. That has happened. I mean, weirdly, those. A lot of uh, solar use in, in Yemen, for instance, for water pumping, of course, not so sustainable in terms of groundwater levels, but uh, it's taken off because of the high diesel price. And you see that in places in Africa as well. Um, yes, there's an opportunity to work around it, but it needs a lot of thought. And I think you need to work on both sides, you know, both with the government and at the local level. Uh, just uh, quickly on uh, the climate. Shall I stop there? And yeah, let's <laughs> sorry. <laughs> You can come back in the very last round. Um, Dan, the UN has been the UN climate regime has been perhaps yeah. slow to recognise the importance of that link. Does it have a role to play? Perhaps slow. Okay. <laughs> no, I think. Um, I mean, I think the answer on COP twenty six is that no, there was no real focus there, and there was certainly nothing that was kind of actionable and actioned coming coming out of it. Um, to be fair to the UK government, it is one that has for, for, for a long time and under different parties and under different prime ministers taken seriously the link between climate change and insecurity. I don't know if you remember, but I mean, it was a, the Labour government that first um, took the issue to the UN Security Council in 2007. But when William Hague was Foreign Secretary, he declared climate change to be one of the two great security challenges that we fa face in our time. Um, I think, to be honest, that I would say that it is the environmental side of this uh, pair that has had greater difficulty in taking on the security ramifications. Whereas you look on the security policy side, both amongst those with a kind of relatively broad definition of security, like that's human security and so on, but also those sticking with a fairly narrow hard security definition have understood that security that climate change and other environmental effects have an impact on their operating environment so some of this starts from thinking about military bases some of it starts from thinking about in what context are they going to be operating in 20 or 30 years time actually uh, some parts of the military are going green quite quickly because being self-reliant and sustainable uh, makes a lot more strategic and tactical sense than having extended supply lines, uh, which are vulnerable to, to interdiction and, and, and attack. And they also look at some of the societal uh, impacts as well. Um, so NATO is starting a center of excellence on climate change and security. Um, the Defense Concepts and Doctrine Center at Shrivenham uh, in the UK has been working on these issues for 15 years at least, um, maybe longer. It's the environmentalists who very often kind of, you know, gather their skirts around them at the term security and they say, oh gosh, you're trying to securitize the issue. As I said, nobody is bringing these issues together. These issues are together. So by not looking at it clearly in, um, in the environmental movements, environmental organizations, they're really missing something. Can this move forward? I think that it's will be interesting to see how this plays out with COP27 and COP28 this year in Egypt and next year in the, the UAE. I think it's interesting also to look at what might happen with the climate security mechanism, which is the small unit in the department of the, of the UN um, that's there both to brief the agencies, but also to brief the Security Council. I think there is increasing recognition of this at the UN level. But the UN is a very, very complex beast. In the end, I think it will be member states who put this issue into the probably COP28 COP rather than COP27. Very I interesting. Um, Adeniki, did you want to add anything to this or 
Should we brief comment or shall we move to the last question? So, okay, I just want to add to it. Um, when it was mentioned about um, um, climate and conflict and, and um, COP, and I think I've pre represented Nigeria at COP25, COP26, and maybe probably COP27, maybe. And so I, I I did come towards the terms of um, climate and security, but one of those things that I mentioned was about the climate finance, women and uh, for women and girls and the rest. But I think it's an issue that we need to look inward into to see that we bring it to COP processes to see how we could deal with it. And one important thing I also want to mention is about um, the United Nations Security Councils that have to do with um, the peace and security issue looking at the fact that we have only five um, permanent um, um, members that could only decide on these issues. We, there was a time that this issue of climate conflict um, came up, you know, and what it was, um, but it was stepped down because probably it's not a reality for country in global north or global west to see. But it, to us here in Africa, it's a reality. And I think there is a call for us to to, to bring in another um, structure that we enable every country to have a say at the council meeting, to see that we bring in um, um, climate and conflict into the proper pro processes of conference of parties, to see how we could also deliberate on such issue that is affecting us. Because these are issues that, is, that could grow into a bigger or larger um, crisis if we don't deal with it. It could even result to war. We saw it with the Darfur crisis that led to tens of uh, thousands of people that died. And so if we don't um, bring this kind of issue, if we don't discuss on it, if we don't act on it at COP processes, it is possible that we might still be in the stage of still um, making statements uh, or still negotiating. For it. So we need to reshuffle or bring in different structures that recognize this issue in the broader aspects so that we could all talk about it after the the, 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 the signal of this crisis. Thank you. Adeniki, you're breaking up slightly, but it is actually the point where I do need to call this to a close because we've reached the end of our allotted time. Um, there were a few more questions that I wanted to bring in. Apologies that we didn't have more time for this, but I think we've, we've uh, covered important ground. We've moved uh, swiftly from the local to the international. And there's now a chance, if you would like to join us upstairs in the library, to continue the conversation with a drink in hand. So please join me in thanking the panelists, both online and in the room. Thank you.